Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the National Building Museum. My name is Scott Kratz. I'm the Vice President for Education here at the museum. And tonight's program kicks off a brand new series called For the Greener Good, Conversations That Can Change the World. The goal of this series is to bring together the nation's leading experts to discuss sustainability and the built environment. The programs will track how we've arrived at our present situation, the anticipated and unexpected effects of the green movement, and offer considerations on a path to a more sustainable future. It is important that these programs provide not only solutions, but also how you, the audience, can participate in creating a better future. And as part of that effort, uh, these programs are meant to be conversational in format. Uh, we will periodically break during the program to take questions and comments from the audience. And at the end of the program tonight, we invite you to continue the conversation with both participants that are up here on stage with me, uh, as well as those who are sitting next to you uh, tonight in the audience, um, at an informal reception in the museum center court, located just over here. During the, during the reception, museum staff will be on hand to prompt feedback about the program, and also to encourage further discussion about issues that are raised tonight. If you like what you hear and experience uh, tonight, we invite you to our next program in the series entitled Gone Fission, Can Nuclear Energy Help Save the Environment, which will be here at the museum on October 22nd. As with the other programs in this series, we've invited speakers representing a diversity of professions and views to discuss the future of nuclear energy in America. Joining us on the 22nd will be uh, the immediate past chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, a founding director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, and the president of Constellation Energy Generation Group, who recently began the permitting process to build a new nuclear plant in Maryland. Uh, Matthew Wald, who's a journalist from the New York Times, will moderate the session, which will begin with a premiere screening of The Future of Energy from the new documentary series E Squared Energy, which will air on PBS in November of 2007. It's my great pleasure to um, thank um, the sponsors for this evening. The For the Greener Good series is presented by the museum's sustainability partner, which is the Home Depot Foundation. And we would like to thank them for their generous support of this innovative lecture series. Tonight's program is provocatively entitled, Can the Suburbs Kill You? Uh, and we have an amazing group joining us for this inaugural event. Um, and before we get, uh, begin with the program, I have a question for all of you. Can I see, just so the panelists have an idea of, of who's out there in the audience, by a show of hands, can, um, I'm going to ask, run through some quick professions just to see who's out in the audience. Can I see any architects there in the audience? <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, and planners? Great. Educators? Journalists? <laughs> Great. Um, who did I miss? Feel free just to go ahead and call out. Public health, okay. Public health yeah. landscape yeah. architects, real estate, general contractors. <laughs> That's great. Medicine, preservation, philanthropists. That's great. Sustainability, ordinary resident. Ordinary resident. <laughs> That's yeah. great. As usual, um, the uh, audiences here at the Building Museum reflect a wide diversity of professions and interests, which is great. And that's really been the goal of this entire series, is to um, reflect that diversity of voices that are up here. So we, um, that was to get everyone's sort of, um, vocal cords going, and we encourage you to use those as we go through the program. Um, so on to tonight's program. Leading the discussion will be the museum's very own Susan Piedmont Palladino, who is an architect, a curator at the museum, and an associate professor of architecture at the Washington Alexandria Architecture Consortium, part of Virginia Tech's School of Architecture and Design. Susan received her Master's of Architecture from Virginia Tech and her Bachelor of Arts in the History of Art from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. Her first book, Devil's Workshop, 25 Years of Jersey Devil Architecture, was published by Princeton Architectural Press. Her articles have appeared in such publications as the Journal of Architectural Education, the Journal of Urban Technology, and Perspecta 29, among others. She was the guest curator for, uh, for the exhibition Tools of the Imagination here at the Building Museum, and an editor of the companion book of the same name. 
Susan is currently working on a brand new exhibition um, the, here at the National Building Museum on sustainable communities, which is set to open in October of 2008. I'm sure tonight's program will inform those efforts. Um, I'd like to introduce Susan Piedmont Palladino, who then in turn will uh, introduce the other panelists tonight. I'm glad to see everybody here, and we set the chairs up a little close to the stage, a little bit different from the typical slideshow format, because we really do want this to be a conversation. So we'll be stopping the discussion every now and then, and if you have a question or a comment, just let me know, and we'll make time to listen to it. Uh, it's quite a heavy title we have for our program, Can the Suburbs Kill You? And I don't think we're going to have yes and no answers <laughs> just running down the line. Um, but to get started, I'd like to give brief introductions to our prestigious panelists. Full introductions would take up the entire evening, so I will apologize ahead of time for not sort of fully introducing them. Right to my right is Glenn Barnard, and Glenn is a senior vice president in the KB Next group of KB Home, formerly known as Kaufman and Broad, and it's one of the major home building companies in the U.S. It's a national company headquartered in Los Angeles but has work all over the country. And Glenn has over 20 years experience in the field of residential development. To Glenn's right is Robert Fishman. Robert holds the Emil Lorch Professorship at the Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Michigan. His book, Bourgeois Utopias, The Rise and Fall of Suburbia is, I'm probably not exaggerating, an essential text for all students of planning history. And moving on down the line, we have Dr. Howie Frumkin. And Howie is the director is a long set of names, a director of the National Center for Environmental Health and the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. And Howie was one of the authors of a fascinating book called Urban Sprawl and Public Health, Designing and Planning and Building Healthy Communities. And finally, at the end of the line, we have Margaret Walls, and Margaret is a senior fellow at Resources for the Future, which is a nonprofit research organization here in Washington. She holds a PhD in economics, and her research has focused on land use, development, and environmental issues. So the way we'll start off is I'm going to ask a question of each of you. And from your own particular perspective, this represents very interesting polls of perspective on this topic of the suburbs. And Robert, you're the historian among the group, so I'm actually going to start with you. Um, your book, Bourgeois Utopias, reveals this much longer and more complex history of the idea of suburbia and the ideal of suburbia. And it's much more complex than many of us realize. And you talk about the significant changes in the meaning of the word suburbia over time. What was it about the pre-industrial city and the industrial city that gave rise to this idea of suburbia? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, thank you, Susan, and thank you to the, to the audience uh, for, for being, being here uh, for this discussion. And I think yeah, looking at the history of, of suburbs from the perspective of health, that what we see first is that the whole, in many ways, the deepest Im impulse for suburbanization was the health impulse. Because basically, it, this was pretty clear, cities, especially the industrial cities of the 19th century, the cities could kill you. They really did kill you with, uh, uh, with, with bad water, uh, with bad air. The people just didn't know how to deal with the massive growth and crowding. So the, the suburban environment that took shape in the 19th century, the whole suburban design language that really still persists to, the, to this day, uh, was about uh, not just symbolizing health, but uh, making a healthy life possible. And greenery, uh, the, a, uh, a house of your own with, with green lawn around it, uh, that was not just aesthetically pleasing, it wasn't just uh, socially prestigious it would save your life, and especially save your children's life, lives. Because by going to this low density form, you escaped the, uh, you know, the impossible environmental problems of the city. Uh, you, know, you got the clean water, you got the clean air that you and your children needed, needed to survive. 
And I think the whole design language as it took shape, as I say, in the 19th century with such you know, uh, figures of genius as Frederick Law Olmsted, was not just about escaping the city, but about how to live a healthy life. How, uh, for example, the beautifully curving streets of the classic 19th century suburbs were really meant to be used as walking paths and as bicycling paths, as ho for horse riding. Uh, this was exercise. Uh, what was known as a parkway in the 19th century was, all of, uh, was a linear park that extended through the suburb. Uh, the the uh, separation between the houses was to guarantee this measure, this measure of health. Even uh, the way the suburbs were planned in the sense that almost every suburb was on a transit line because that was the only way you could get anywhere, get into the city. So that meant exercise in the sense that you had to walk to the transit stop. Plus, the suburb couldn't sprawl because everybody had to be within walking distance of that stop. So you were very close uh, to open space. Uh, so it was an amazingly healthy environment. And I think there's a lot to be learned, really, from the way in which the 19th century planners and designers made health, uh, uh, realized health, uh, in, ter in terms of design. Of course, what happened, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be brief about this, what, what happened was what we call sprawl. Yes basically automobile-based development where you didn't have to live within walking distance of a transit line so the open space could be filled in. Uh, you could have uh, suburbs instead of uh, being confined to this brief belt between the city and the open countryside, the suburb became uh, virtually the whole region. And uh, with, the, with the automobile, with automobile transportation, you could go directly from point to point uh, anywhere in this big region without hardly leaving your car at all. So the suburbs became, in effect, a new kind of city, a low-density city. And with that transformation uh, into what we call sprawl, this very healthy early suburb, the very healthy uh, suburban design that first existed has been lost, in my view. And I think one of our great tasks right now is to rethink where we are and to somehow reinstitute that connection between design and health that we lost. Well, that attempt to sort of rethink where we are and to consider where we are, um, that leads right into a question I have for Glenn, because your work involves directly rethinking where we are and then actually trying to make something new out of it and it's your business to put that into place. Um, you've been doing this for a while, and I think that these ideas and ideals of suburbia still exercise a huge hold over the popular imagination and over the general public. But we have all these new words, livability, walkability, sustainability, uh, and how does that add to the vision of what makes a good suburb today? And what is the difference between the suburbs of decades ago and the work you're doing now? Microphone. Yeah. 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 Are we on? I have a green light. He says, Hal says you're good. Ah, good. Is that better? No. No? Okay. <laughs> sure. That's so, not better. No, that's not better. It's always a technology problem. It is funny to think, Robert, your comment that um, if we were having this program 150 years ago, we'd be saying, can the cities kill you? Right, right, and uh, in some way, uh, just one, I might just say one, one word if you're not, if you're not ready that the, yeah. <laughs> I, I, are you ready? ready? Are okay. you ready? I'll, I'll, ready. Leave, I'll leave it be. We'll, we'll get. No, 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 it's your, your turn. Uh, my comment, joking comment, was the more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, I was fascinated to hear Robert's description of reasons why people desired suburbia. And actually, those reasons still exist today. If you, as we do as a regular part of our, of our business, if you were to ask consumers, what are the most important things about a neighborhood? The two things 
that are always at the top of the list are sidewalks and walking and biking trails. So that hasn't changed for over 100 years, but somehow we've gotten away from that and into we need clubhouses, we need swimming pools, we need gated entries, we need huge grandiose monumentation at the front of a community when actually what people really want is to be able to use the community that they live in. And if it connects to, a, to another community adjacent to it or parks or amenities or whatever, so much the better. But the world really has not changed. Now, one of the things I, could always, I can always indict my industry about is that we do too much of building what we want to build and not enough of what people want. Uh, and what people want is what you described. Okay, Margaret, I'm gonna move on down to you. We're skipping over Howie for a minute. Um, because to the outside observer, sometimes sprawl or the suburbs can look like it just happens. You drive out of the city and this world has sprung up seemingly without any rhyme or reason. But there certainly are forces at work. There are forces that are economic and forces that are policy-based and planning. And there's this new phrase, smart growth, that everybody is interested in. And everyone wants to be for smart growth because the alternative isn't a very appealing thing, dumb growth. And so I wonder <laughs> if you want to comment a little bit about the different forms smart growth comes in. Why has that become such an appealing um, description of a new vision of how to develop outside of the cities? Right. Um, I think. Mine's working, right? Yes. Um, first, the forces that create the land use patterns we see, um, you know, part of it is economics. You know, we're a private market-based country. Private, you know, people own land privately and do, to some extent, what they want with it. Um, and so the decisions of, you know, buyers and sellers of homes, you know, to help to determine that. The value of land is high in development, and it used to be a farm. Well, it might get developed. But on the other hand, there are also a, there's a lot of research in economics that suggests that the zoning regulations that we have that are put in place by local governments have a, play a very big role in determining sprawl, if you want to call it sprawl, which is a term I don't like to use because it's not that well defined, but in determining patterns of low density development. Um, so that's something we can talk about more later, but it is, there are reasons why. I mean, we leave a lot of stuff to local government in this country compared to in Europe. You know, local governments finance public services from their own taxes, primarily property taxes, and have strong incentives to set residential density limits the way that they do. Um, there are reasons for that, and that leads to this pattern that you see. If you look at the zoning regulation, residential zoning density limits for any of the counties surrounding the Washington area, just go and look on the website of Fairfax County. And, you know, there are many swaths of the county which are, you know, one acre lot uh, is the maximum average density. You know, that's, that's a pretty big lot for somebody. And, you know, that's, you know, there are some that are half acres. That's still a pretty big lot, really. So that the, we have to take a hard look at the zoning, I think. Smart growth, um, and Susan's asking me this question because Resources for the Future and University of Maryland's National Center for Smart Growth are holding a, a three-day conference next week to look at Maryland's Smart Growth Program, which has been in place for 10 years. And um, smart growth, um, and we just had a discussion about where the term actually came from. We're not exactly sure who, what the origin is. But smart growth is a term that many of you may know more about this, but that is used these days to describe a certain way of communities growing, uh, a certain form of planning, and it usually has a, a, a set of different characteristics, and among those are things like, tra you know, building near transit, um, building compact developments, um, uh, having sidewalks would certainly be one, um, and the, the policies that get put in place to sort of generate what are called smart growth outcomes can vary by communities. Um, in many places, in, in Maryland, the primary tool that they use is what they call priority funding areas, where the state actually has said any of the existing municipalities or other communities that meet certain characteristics get priority for state funding 
for roads and, and other th infrastructure. And that's, so they've tried to put an incentive in place to guide development to not uh, outside of the, um, you know, urban fringe areas and get the, into the town centers. You know, what we're going to discuss next week is whether or not that's worked very well. And some people think it, it hasn't. But other communities do other things. They, you know, some communities do green belts to try to control sprawl. All of those sorts of things would be instruments that attempt to get that some measure of smart growth. Um, <clears throat> In some of the research we've looked at, um, the kind of work I do is tends to try to get data and look at, you can use economic models to see if we can explain the patterns of development. And um, in some cases, in some of these communities, it appears you're, you're pushing up against, in some cases, what people want. Um, and that may be a problem that we need to face. How much do we want to force people to do something that perhaps goes against what they really want to do? It's interesting you've talked about various tools that different jurisdictions have and instruments to make those happen. And also each of those decisions, like the 19th century concepts of zoning, have had consequences that were intended and also some unintended consequences. Um, before we go on, I just want to make sure if there are any comments or questions from the audience at this point, now that we've sort of laid out some of the basic themes, if anyone would like to add anything uh, or if they think that we haven't covered their topic well. <laughs> Um, if not, we'll just go on, um, because I'm really curious about how each of the different fields that are represented up here, economics, public health, history, and development, how you sort of amass your own tools. What's your set of, um, how do you get your data, how do you do your research that basically lets you act, um, either to improve conditions or to make the argument that we should change conditions? How do you argue? to a public agency, <clears throat> excuse me, that they should change how they're doing things? How do you convince or be persuaded by the general public how they want to live? And what does history tell us, Robert, about how we can generalize about how we have lived? Um, Glenn, do you want to take that uh, one first? Or? How, do you, do you wanna, <laughs> I think we, or we, we skipped over. We skipped yeah. the... Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. how, we, we oh, we did. I'm sorry, yeah, we did right. skip over Howie. Thank yeah. you, Robert. Yes, and that we shouldn't have done that. Um, I was sort of getting ahead of myself listening to the discussion of planning and policy. Well, Howie, it's your research on really the health consequences of sprawl, which is now a word that we don't really know what it means, but we're going to keep using it anyway, um, or uncontrolled growth or automobile dependent growth because the automobile is that uh, machine that's hiding right behind us that underlines some of these issues. Um, if, as Robert suggests, the suburbs originated in, as the healthy alternative to the nasty industrial city, what happened since then? What happened to that idea? How is it that that is now the problem? Yeah. Well, I think we, we got some things we weren't counting on. Robert's exactly right that people fled the cities for the suburbs looking, among other things, for better health. But that was so 19th century. Because <laughs> once we got there, we found out that it wasn't necessarily as healthy as we thought. Let's look at some of the major health problems we face as a country now. Think about heart disease, the major killer. Think about cancer, collectively the second major killer. Think about asthma, which has been rising steadily and now affects something like 7 or 8% of Americans. Think about car crashes, the major killer of young people in this country. We lose 40,000 Americans to car crashes every year. Think about mental illness, mental distress, a whole range of conditions depression, anxiety, even conditions that aren't diagnosable but certainly affect a lot of people like loneliness and social isolation. For all of those and many other conditions, there are links to the way we design and build our communities. Heart disease and cancer. Well, it turns out that being sedentary is a major risk factor for heart disease. Being overweight is a major risk factor for heart disease. And if we design and build communities that engineer out physical activity, and require that we lead sedentary lifestyles, doing a lot of our traveling in cars, then we increase the risk of heart disease. The very same is true of cancer. Being sedentary is a risk factor for cancer, and it's remarkable that it operates across a wide range of cancer types. Being overweight is a risk factor for cancer. So as we see ourselves become a more sedentary and overweight society, part of that has to do with the way we design communities. Asthma is rising. Well, as we use more and more automobiles, we foul the air sheds of the places that we inhabit. And so you look at the most automobile-dependent cities, Los Angeles, Atlanta, 
Those are the cities with some of the most intractable air quality problems. And we regularly see more kids coming to emergency rooms with asthma attacks on the days when the air quality is worse. Car crashes. Being in a car is the prototypical place to be in many low-density sprawling communities, but the car is a dangerous microenvironment to be in. The car is a dangerous way to travel. And all things being equal, the more time you spend in a dangerous environment, the higher the chance that a bad thing's going to happen. And then with the mental illness and distress, we, we almost have more questions than answers, but lots of questions that are very important to ask. Um, I need to, to out Scott. Scott gave that very nice introduction at the beginning of the evening. And what you all don't realize is that Scott made uh, a stunning confession as we were talking just before the introduction. He said that when he used to live in Los Angeles, he used to drive a lot. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the horrific things that he uttered about the other drivers <laughs> as he was on the road, uh, shaking his fist through the windshield at them. And he said, now that he's in Washington, using transit and walking more, he actually has many fewer rage reactions against fellow citizens. So that sort of um, that, that, that anger that does seem to be a chronic feature of uh, the mode of transportation we've chosen in many of our communities is an interesting observation, isn't it? We don't track road rage as a diagnosable condition, but I'll tell you that it's interesting to think about it, and we wouldn't be able to track sidewalk rage because nobody's ever heard of it. <laughs> Loneliness and social isolation, perhaps some of the most common problems that Americans suffer from. If we build communities that privatize all of our space, that don't have public space in them, that don't have the ordinary venues where people mix and mingle with each other, like sidewalks and parks, then we, that may contribute to the burden of loneliness and social isolation that seems to be a problem in our country. So for those and other reasons, we do need to think about the mental health aspects of community design. So there you have it, a range of health conditions that, that uh, affect us, a range of health conditions that really define the public health challenges we face now, very different from the tuberculosis and diarrheal diseases that were killing people in 19th century America. We've moved on to a new set of health challenges and what do you know, the kinds of communities that we design, build, and inhabit aggravate some of those conditions. And it was really the diseases and the epidemics in the 19th century that gave birth to the idea of public health, that gathering data about the cause and effect of bad water. And so to return to this idea of um, where does the information come from to make these decisions, um, you sort of have cited an awful lot of examples of conditions that are rising, and the question always is, well, are this really causal relationships? And um, so I'm curious about the different disciplines that each of you represent and how you actually do look at that information to sort of draw your conclusions. And um, Robert, actually, what, what does history, what does yeah. history tell us yeah. about? Yeah. Uh, I guess it does seem like a somewhat strange uh, strategy to, to think about uh, to think about the problems of today by going off into the archives and learning more and more about what happened in the 19th century or earlier, uh, but I do it anyway. <laughs> and I think the reason is that I, I think I study history in part to free us from history. Because I think we are prisoners of ideas of the past when these, you know, when the base, our basic way of living has changed. And there's no better example of that than the American Dream House, which is still, I mean, Glenn is exactly right, that people want uh, pretty much what they wanted, you know, what the elite wanted and got in the 19th century. The problem is that when you keep building these American Dream Houses in the middle of sprawl, you're going to get something completely different. You're going to get the opposite of the compact community, compact walkable communities that the early suburbs were. And the more you build, uh, the more sprawl we're, go we're going to get. So I think by pointing out that these ideas, uh, these goals came from a totally different society, a different spatial context, uh, what I'm trying to do is free people from that uh, uh, slavery to the past and get us thinking about what what health and society means today. And so that ideal of the dream house on the plot of land, and you, in your book you write about the, the style of suburbia and the villa. Yeah. Um, is, this what, is this what people want today, Glenn, as you sort of do your market research? What are, what are people telling you about how they envision that way they want to live? 
Well, I mean, for a whole set of Americans, they want to own a house. I mean, the, the, I mean fortunately, we're still for my industry, although there are a lot fewer of them this month than there were two years ago, <laughs> which is why I have time to come talk. <laughs> we're, not, we're not busy framing houses. Um, we, every year, uh, survey, we have a proprietary survey group, and we survey people who bought a house in every one of our markets um, in, the, in the past year. And so we accumulate 60 or 70,000 surveys from, from people talking about what they did, why they did it, what they would have preferred to have done, and what trade-offs they made. And, and buying a house, how many of you here have bought a house? Does a condo count? Okay. <laughs> buying a house is the greatest trade-off game you'll ever go through because you, you don't get everything you want, regardless of the price point at which you buy. It, it's a giant trade-off game. And so what we try to, try to find out and try to disentangle is under what circumstances do people make various choices. The, by far the biggest trade-off issue today is the A word, affordability. And the problems, uh, part, of the, part of the fascinating uh, things that my colleagues have said is, Margaret's talked about e basically what amounts to economic zoning and, and the economy of land use. And Robert's talked about what we've done in the past and how that predicts the future. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could return to suburbs that were convenient to a train that were convenient to, to this, that, and the other thing. And the reality is that, is that today we can't do that. I mean, that's just pure and simple. The, the, the lower your household income, the less alternative you have to execute the things that we'd like you to be able to do. We have, we have a concept in my company of we try to service the median buyer. Because if we service the median buyer, then we've serviced the high point of the market. And today, in many, many cities, the median, the median household income can't buy the median home. And that's a problem. Because those people have to make trade-offs, and some of the trade-offs they make are to sit in their car longer to commute, to not be able to buy a large lot because the lot costs too much, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, the, one of the ways that we can't ignore what the consumer tells us is, all we'd like to do is buy the median house and buy those things that people used to buy in the 19th century. So we can't we can't attack this problem without also attacking the problem of how do we make it affordable to the to the middle of the market, which is the largest amount of our our home buyers and our consumers. Well, affordability is, is one of those huge issues and also kind of a tough word to define in some ways um, because each jurisdiction, it's a little bit different and defined differently. Margaret, from the economic perspective, are there all these hidden uh, factors in how we define affordability? I mean, if someone doesn't need to own a car, for example, that sort of changes how much they have to spend on their house and it changes the equation. But the car seems to be such a part of the package of that image of how to live. Right, I think that's true and um, there have been discussions about that issue that if someone buys a house near transit that they could afford more of a mortgage because they are, don't have their car payment or they right. are fewer costs associated with driving. I think that tends to get capitalized into house prices so I don't, I don't really buy that <laughs> argument too much. Um, I think um, you know, on the affordability front, another uh, constraining, another issue here is when we try to do things like some of the things I described in the smart growth area, we try to put some of these policies in place, we have to be careful because we do affect affordability. Mm -hmm. So for example, in communities where we put in green belts or urban growth boundaries, you know, it, it can have an effect on house prices when you're drawing restrictions like that. So I think the idea of smart growth 
originally and is to try to, again, leave the word growth in there and try to figure out how to grow in, in the way that doesn't um, make things too expensive. And of course, Glenn, you talk about that people still want the same things they've always wanted. And, uh, but Howie, from the public health perspective, just because people want something doesn't mean it's good for them or that they should have it. Um, so from your perspective, how do you look at what the consequences are of where we've been? And what are you doing now about sort of looking at current, more urban development, some of the work you're doing in Atlanta right now? Do you want to talk about some of that in terms of looking ahead? Well, great question. Uh, just because people want something doesn't necessarily mean it's good for them, but equally important, just because people want something today doesn't mean they need to want the same thing tomorrow. One of the things we do routinely in public health is uh, educate the public about the health consequences of choices they make in hopes that people will make healthy choices. Not as many Americans smoke now as did 20 years ago, and that's the result of a lot of education and building a science base so that the information is available to share with the public. So part of what we do is try to build the science base and learn on a factual level what it is about community design that's good for health and what's bad for health. People deserve to have that information as they make their choices. Um, what we'd love to do is randomize clinical trials. That's the gold standard. So everybody on this side of the room gets assigned to live in a walkable, <laughs> grid-like, mixed-use community with good transit. And everybody on this side gets assigned to live in outer Siberia and, and Virginia. And, um, we come back in 10 years and look at everybody's blood pressure and weight and physical activity patterns, and then we can conclude what it was about the community that, that made people uh, healthy or not healthy. But that's not a practical thing to do, obviously. So sometimes we do observational studies. You might compare the levels of physical activity in walkable neighborhoods and non-walkable neighborhoods. That's been done a lot. And guess what? In walkable neighborhoods, people walk more and in low-density <laughs> suburban neighborhoods, they drive more. That doesn't really prove much, because people may just sort themselves out. It may be that the walkers move to the walkable neighborhoods, and the couch potatoes move to the distant suburbs, and you can't really conclude from that that the environment is a causal factor in, in people's uh, physical activity or health. So what we work on now is developing creative ways of approximating experimental trials so that we can observe uh, the impact of the environment on people's health. So Susan made reference to Atlanta. One example is a study that we at CDC are supporting and participating in. We've got a very big uh, brownfield site, 130-acre site in central Atlanta. It's been converted over the past few years from an old steel mill to a mixed-use, walkable, transit-oriented community, all of the features of smart growth. It's such a popular item on the market that people have to sign up a year in advance to get a home there. And so we know for a year before they move who they are and where they live. So we can find them in their native habitat and characterize <laughs> their patterns of living, their weight, their blood pressure, and so on. Then we can come back a year later after they move. Same genes, same age plus a year, same personality structure, same preferences. But if we look at them a year later in their new habitat and we see that they're walking much more, driving much less, they've lost a few pounds and blood pressure has come down, that's going to support the hypothesis that certain environmental design features are good for health. Ultimately, where we'd like to get is to have a good science-based set of recommendations. As I sit here now, I can tell you how often to have a sigmoidoscopy. You don't want to hear it, but I have the evidence to tell you. I can't tell you whether we need sidewalks on both sides of the street or just one side of the street. I can't tell you how many trees we need on urban streets to make them seductive to people who want to go out there and walk on them. So we really need to learn those features so that the health sciences can link up with planners, architects, and designers and put forward the best information about what's healthy for people. People care a lot about their health. Given information about the health consequences of their choices, people will factor that into their decision making. And so that's really the role of, of, of medical science and public health in this whole big picture. Interesting time now to see if the audience has any thoughts on this. Yes. Yeah, I, I, before we go on, I have a question about two of the things that you all were saying. One is the economics. And I, I'm curious whether you know, are more compact urban fabrics more expensive or less expensive to build? You, 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 you tell us we can't afford to give people dense cities. But is there a hidden cost that we are paying 
that is not in the sale price of the home. And then the other one is um, really one of desire. You know, I didn't know I liked broccoli until I tried it. <laughs> How many people in the United States have actually lived in the city to determine they, that is what they want? Um, or do we tend to want what we were grown up um, having the experiences of, which is the single family home? So is, is suburbia hereditary? <laughs> Who wants to take this one? Yeah. Margaret's nodding. Oh, well, yes. I, I mean, it brings up, this is based on personal experience more than research, but I, I wonder how many people have lived in really different locations. I'm, I'm thinking of how I live now compared to, and I live in suburbia, I'm sorry, yeah. I have to admit it. Um, it but it gets at this, this cause and effect thing and how people sort themselves, and we are who we are, and what we, um, you know, we care about going for a jog every day, we do sort ourselves to, to, to the extent that we can and live in a place where we can do that. Um, if we have big families and we work and we're busy, we're pretty much going to hop in our car to go to the grocery store if it's a mile away. You know, I'm sorry. You know, we're not, we're, most of us are not going to walk to the grocery store. And I, I just have observed my own behavior living in different locations. I'm just wondering what other people have observed about themselves. If you lived in the inner city and whether it's in Europe or here or wherever, and you've lived a really different lifestyle than you live now. I... Well, and I think to follow up a little bit, though, on the other part of the question, which has to do with a bigger picture of affordability, that there are costs over time that are waiting for us. Certainly climate change is one of those. All of the sort of impending consequences that are bigger than how we're defining affordability now. Um, Glenn, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, in, in the short term, meaning when somebody goes to purchase a house or, or a builder decides to build a community, generally the equation that changes is the cost of the, of the land under the house. If you're building the same house in suburban Virginia or in metropolitan district of Columbia, there may be some slight differences in labor rates, but the cost of building that same house isn't going to be materially different to the extent that you haven't been required in the approval process to do something markedly different. But let's assume it's the same house. What changes is the price of the land. The closer you get to things that people want to be close to, the higher the price of the land, and that gets reflected in the price of the house. Transit, to the extent that if you look at, uh, we were talking about the city of Chicago earlier, and, and I happen to know quite a bit about the economics of Chicago. Chicago has great train lines that run out from the central city. You can see very distinct patterns in land cost as you move away from those transit lines. The closer you are to the transit line, the land may be double to three times what it is three or four miles away from the transit line that gets reflected in the price of the house. So that's the short-term implication. The longer-term implication is all of the things that people have talked about today. Yeah. And I, well, I, <laughs> I clarify my question? Sure. Um, it's really not, uh, that's market-driven, right? Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. That's, the, wanna, that's the market of buyer and be, seller. Exactly, right. um, but is the cost of sewers, asphalt, uh, running the power lines, um, the, um, supporting the flow of gasoline to build the cars, um, or are those costs, is a two-dimensional city that's spread out in low density more expensive or less expensive as a, collectively as a yeah. society? Different parts of it gets paid but by different groups. Low, I mean, low density, there's certainly more what we call land development expenses per unit because you have more sidewalk, you have more curb, you have more asphalt, you have more sewer, you have more water line, etc. So the larger yeah. the lot, the more expensive it is to perform the actual land development. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's that's very that's very clear. And in terms of long-term demand, uh, what's so striking is that it's precisely the, the the younger people who've grown up in the suburbs, who are the ones who really are the are the true the ones who really want uh, urbanity and walkability. So the more suburbs we build, the more the more customers we're going to have for walkable urbanity. That seems to be the that seems to be the rule. Uh, 
just one more, one more thing, you know, in terms of what, what Howie was saying, that we'd like, of course, to have, you know, to base these policies on the scientific experimentation. First, you prove that uh, walkable urbanity is more healthy and even cheaper and so on, and then you start to build it. The problem is that when you build anything, you're committing yourself for 20, 30 years in advance. So I think what's needed right now is leadership. In other words, uh, people to, and leadership I think is defined by the ability to operate effectively in a situation of uncertainty. We can't absolutely prove this health uh, differential, but I think we know enough that it's time for there to be some real leadership in terms of how the future of this country is going to be built. Howie, did you want to pick up on this other issue of the hidden costs? Certainly there are medical costs and insurance costs and lost productivity. If we factor in the medicalization of sprawl, then the issue of the cost to society is greater in the same way the cost of resources or protecting our access to resources becomes an add-on to it. And those are in some ways the invisible or the costs that are over the horizon that we're not looking directly at. Well, that, that's exactly right, so, and that even expands the question. It was a great question, but if you go beyond the infrastructure costs to the health care costs and the costs to the social fabric of building communities that aren't as functional as they could be, I don't know of anybody who's ever done that analysis, but certainly we'd see a lot of externalized or hidden costs that we don't currently take into account. I did want to go back to the broccoli issue, though. <laughs> um, that's important. Harriet Tregoning, who's been a real leader nationally in smart growth, uh, talks about lettuce instead of broccoli. She says, you know, when we were kids, what did we have when we had salad? It was iceberg lettuce, and that's all there was, and we ate it, and we liked it pretty well. But now you go to the store, and there's romaine, and there's red leaf, and there's everything else. It turns out if you have a lot of choices out there in the market, consumers like a lot more things than they thought they liked. Well, the market's arguably been serving up only one product for several decades, and that's the single-family suburban home. Um, now that more things are coming on the market, I think what we're seeing is evidence of pent-up demand. I think lots of people objectively are interested in living in, in uh, smart growth or urban communities. Not everybody. I mean, this is a free country, and people are going to exercise different choices. But one of the very interesting signals, and I say this as a non-economist, I know less about economics than anybody on this stage, but you know, we, we track this concept of gentrification uh, a lot. It, it, it's, a, it's a source of real concern because there were profound equity questions raised as we redevelop cities and people at the lower end of the economic ladder get pushed out. But what's happening there is that you build these smart growth attractive neighborhoods and the prices skyrocket. The prices on these things rise much faster than other kinds of real estate. Well, hello, that's a market signal, isn't it? That's the market talking, saying that there's a lot of demand for this product out there that we haven't really been serving for the last few decades. So I think objectively what we're seeing is these things are, are in many cases doing very well economically. Certainly in Atlanta, where I live, the best-selling products are the walkable in-town uh, communities that are being built now. And I think that success will engender success. I think we're seeing more and more of those projects being built and uh, more developers getting interested in this area. So it's, it, it isn't all going to be science that drives it. The market's going to help drive it too, but I think we're going to be moving in that direction more and more in coming years. Margaret, did you want to add anything I, to the economic interpretation? Well, the market is doing it, but I want to heart, return to my zoning uh, <laughs> point because that it really drives a lot of what we see. Your question about affordability and, Glenn, your response about the same house in D.C. would cost more because the land is expensive, probably means we shouldn't build the same house. What we might end up doing because we're regulated to single-family homes is we might build a really expensive house. But maybe what we should do is have multifamily homes. You know, I mean, there, there are so many restrictions on what we can do in different places, and those things become very entrenched. And, you know, we see that, I know whoever lives in suburban Virginia might follow the um, the fights over what to do around the West Falls Church Metro, where they want to make that area mixed-use, um, highly dense residential area, but the people who live somewhat nearby in single-family homes don't really want that. So there's a lot of, you know, give and take with the county, and, um, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where that stands and, and what's going to be built there, but we have to recognize that uh, local government regulations are playing a very big role. Must be other comments, because I've seen people waving their hands. Yes, sir. We do have a microphone. So. 
Scott will scurry around with the microphone. Aren't our patterns of development uh, going to change uh, dramatically as we get closer to the end of cheap oil? Yes, that's the elephant in the room. Uh, and where we are relative to that is, we'd have to ask someone else up on the panel who's an expert in that, but well, your thoughts on forcing uh, change. Yeah. It, it's very interesting. The, the thing that often doesn't get talked about is that a house itself is highly petroleum-based. So it's not just the cars that are in, there, in the garage, it's the products in the house. So that the, you know, that to the extent that petroleum costs increase today where because of supply and demand uh, construction material pricing is not rising in most in most cases except those items like carpeting which are how many people in here realize how much petroleum there is in a, in a, in a square yard of carpet those those building materials today that have a high petroleum content are rising even in the face of poor demand. So it, it's not just the car, it's not just the cost of society of, of road rage or people living somewhere else, it's also the basic cost of the, of the structure. Robert, did yeah, you? Huge issue. And, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree and I just wanted to add that even if oil prices stay, or stay the same forever, which of course we know they don't, we're going to have some, some fundamental change, I think, just because of changes in our family structures. Uh, families are getting smaller. We have more uh, what, are, what are sometimes called one-person one person households. Uh, Margaret's, uh, rather Susan's colleague, uh, Arthur, uh, Chris Nelson, has done an amazing study in which he's, he predicts that right now com uh, he's compared demand you know, for uh, projected demand uh, for the next 20 years and his projection is in terms of large single-family houses right now right on the ground already built we have twice as many as the demand will be in 20 years now there's every house you build even if you stop building those houses right away you know right to, right today there is going to be a tremendous surplus of them on the market and that's going to change the way we live and build Got a few more questions, I think. Back, uh, back there. Yeah. Hi, I work on affordable housing, and a lot of what I see in affordable housing is similar, the same health problems as we see in the suburbs, where there's asthma and obesity and a lot of other problems. Other than the fact that it's not really a walkable neighborhood, um, even though it's very urban and dense, what are the other variables there that, that are comparable? Well, it, it's important to, and I think everybody's clear on this, that, that the, uh, the built environment, the, the community and building design isn't the whole story. There are lots of factors that determine people's health, and uh, the folks that you're working with to, to provide affordable housing are typically people of low means. Poverty is a terrible predictor of disease. Poverty is bad for health, and so you're looking probably at a lot of the outcomes of poverty Alongside those, there may be some housing-related or some job-related or some macro-environment-related contributors to bad health as well. So I, I, I think we need to remember, and your question reminds us, that alongside designing and building healthy places, we need to do all the other things that it takes to keep people good and healthy. We'll take one more, then we'll get back to the panel right there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Right. Well, here comes Scott with the microphones. Okay. We'll, he's getting a workout. <laughs> All right. It's Scott's a, going to be down to 120. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a walkable, yeah, walkable. landscape. Um, I think there are two other trends that would be um, interesting to add to the conversation. Uh, one is the changing population profile in the United States and in some other developing nations. That is, the, the big glut of baby boomers uh, aging. Uh, and uh, still in suburbia for the most part, but who soon may not be able to cope with suburbia or who may not want to. So uh, that's a question both on the health side, I think, and on the housing side and, and smart growth and so forth. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, and um, uh, 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 how you talked about 
um, obesity. Um, the the, the, pop, the uh, children's population, the unpopulation of obesity among kids is, is horrendous. Um, and indeed, you know, many of the stats now say that uh, young kids have lower life expectancies um, than their parents. So there's the children issue, and part of the ch children children's issue um, has to do with uh, what people have talked about is the disconnection with nature. The kids yeah. are more sedentary than ever with computers and so forth, but I would maintain that that's happening to adults too. So all of that for the panel. I think in general these big demographic changes, shrinking households but growing houses, um, baby boomers. Uh, that, that's not entirely true. Um, my company builds in 35 different markets across the country, and last year, only 35% of our buyers were Caucasian. This is an ethnic world. Foreign immigration uh, has made a huge, is starting to make a huge difference, and in, in ethnicity is starting to make a huge difference in particularly the first time, the first move up buyer. And many of those uh, ethnic groups actually have large household sizes. So we find, we find in our communities today a broader spectrum of demographics than we've ever seen in the 20 some years I've been in, the, in, the, in this industry. Single females, single males, couples, no kids, couples with children, various Asian groups, Hispanics, African Americans, Caucasians, all living in the same community. Um, you raised a great question about both elders and young kids, and I, I think I would generalize that as we do in public health. Ask the question, who's most vulnerable? For, for any policy decision we contemplate, whether it's a, a land use or a transportation decision or whatever, who's most vulnerable, who's most likely to get hurt, and how do we protect those people? So elders are a very important group in that respect. Children are an important group. People with disabilities are an important group. What's remarkable is that in the context of tonight's discussion, community design, the very same interventions turn out to serve many of those groups well. Uh, so elders who can no longer drive aren't well served by communities where driving is the only way to get around. So mixed use, uh, shorter distances, uh, good sidewalks and pedestrian infrastructure are, are invaluable for elders. Those same things are invaluable for kids who can't get out and explore communities on their own if these are communities that kids can't navigate farther away than in a short distance. People with disabilities need good infrastructure with ramps on sidewalks, good broad sidewalks, and so on. Well, a sort of an integrated approach to designing and building communities that serve the most vulnerable subpopulations among us. And make no mistake, all of us at some point in our lives will belong to one or two or three of those subpopulations. Um, that's an effective way to protect public health across the spectrum. Robert, did yeah. you want to add to that? And just just a brief a brief comment about uh, about children. Uh, I'd rather not think about the elderly and the aging. I'm getting getting too close <laughs> to that myself. But the the, uh, the the situation with suburban schools, I think, aptly illustrates the point of how an image can become obsolete and serve its opposite purposes. The early suburban schools seemed to be wonderful for their big lawns surrounding them and the playing fields, and these were then written into regulations and so on. The result was that to build, new, uh, to build a new school, you need so much land that you have to build it at the very edge of the community, uh, perhaps very, much larger than you'd like it. The result is that the kids have to be bused to this new school that has, you know, that supposedly is there, you know, has these wonderfully healthy uh, fields and playing fields around it. Uh, we have to start rethinking these basic, uh, these seemingly obvious design principles and realize that perhaps a school in a crowded setting that the kids could walk to would be more healthy than one with these beautiful fields around it. Well, that brings us back to the zoning question, Margaret, yeah. that you talked about before. Um, are some of our ideas about zoning obsolete? Is that too blunt an instrument? Are, are those regulations lagging behind contemporary technology and contemporary conditions? I think probably so, but it's difficult to think of an alternative. That everybody <laughs> would go for. Um, you know, one of the things I've done a lot of work on is transferable development rights, which can work with zoning where you allow somebody to 
know, preserve a particular parcel. From development, but transfer their rights somewhere else, and then the developer can build more densely on that other location. It's pretty difficult to get those programs to work the way we want them to work, but it is a good, it, it's a clever idea that I think should be um, explored further. Um, but I don't know, I think zoning's probably here to stay. It's just, um, it we'll have to work within the system probably. Well, of course, one of the, you know, panaceas to all of this is the thought that you could do everything you need to do by the internet and just stay in your home and that it's really the automobile that's the problem. So. Telecommuting, are there technological strategies or is there something about, back to the isolation issue, that that causes its own problems even as it solves another set of them? And people will still flock to Starbucks to use their computers by themselves. So there's something in history <laughs> that tells us that we still want to gather in places. Is telecommuting or in suburbs now, is this an idea of changing zoning a little bit to allow people to have home businesses, or is that meeting too much opposition? And I don't actually know about that. I have done mm -hmm. some research on what explains telecommuting, because that's one of those things that local governments will really like to try to get more of yes. to solve the congestion and air quality problems. And um, I don't think there's as much of it going on as, as we'd like. Um, but I'm really not sure how the zoning plays into that. Um, it, can, it could, I guess, in terms of home businesses. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to teleworking, uh, there's a, a lot of people interested in looking at the, the whole home shopping mm -hmm. um, behavior and what determines that. I don't think there's been a lot of research on that, but obviously many of us sit at the computer before we go trek out to the <laughs> mall, so, yeah. Any other questions at this point, or we'll, we'll take one here. Uh, hello, I come from Europe, but live in suburbia, so. <laughs> My question is, uh, is there going to be any regulation on uh, the new Mac mansions, Mac mansions um, uh, trend that uh, huge uh, houses do replace a smaller one with a bigger yard and gardens and that was a, so much nicer uh, look in the suburbs that even walking on the streets you, you were able to uh, admire the uh, surroundings and the environment and uh, everything around it. And my other question, question is that uh, coming from Europe, uh, in suburbia, there around the um, uh, residential uh, zones, small markets that people can walk to the small market to buy uh, uh, milk or, or you know, uh, provisions that uh, are necessary during the week. You don't have to drive miles and miles to go to a, a uh, center or a mall to buy your groceries. So if you have any answers to that, I would very much appreciate it. Thank well, you. And that is sort of a zoning question. Could you fit a corner market in a typical suburban neighborhood? Is that something that your customers, Glenn, are interested in? Or is that too strange a concept for the typical suburban neighborhood? No, I, th I, I mean, if you go into most suburbs today that I mean, unfortunately, the retail industry likes to see rooftops before they invest in mm -hmm. the retail. So the retail corner of a community is generally the last thing to develop. But uh, and that then gets into the whole discussion of you know are strip malls the best way to serve the public, and is that you know does that promote to the extent somebody has to get in their car and drive, and you go to four different strip malls as opposed to one central location? What it, what does that do? So. It, it, it's not an easy issue, if you will. Um, generally, no community could support all of the retail uses that you need. So you've yeah. got part of them, but not all of them. Yeah, I think the question was, in some ways, a little smaller scale. The idea that at the end of, that you might convert a suburban house into the corner store, and that gets <laughs> back to the zoning yeah, issue. Right. Certainly in older 18th century neighborhoods like Alexandria or Georgetown, a row house will have a corner market in it. And that would be a walkable, um, solution to it, and I'm curious from the zoning perspective, is that one of those changes that's well likely possible? I mean, zoning is, I think it's possible in some places, definitely, mm -hmm. where mixed use is taking off a lot more. But my impression, and some research I think supports this, is it's very difficult for those uh, businesses to be viable, productive, you know, profitable businesses. Um, if you have a, a community and you have a, a, couple of, a couple of markets, a market, a, a shop, 
you know, really they're competing with the Walmart down the road. And um, I think what people have found is that you can have certain businesses that will work, but others that won't. And our corner store just might be one of those that isn't going to work because we want the Walmart prices and the corner store. And it's a difficult to have both. Well, I think we, uh, did you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Can you stand up at the microphone, yeah. please? Yeah. Yeah. The, the yeah. Mic. Um, I wanted to address the issue of jobs in the suburbs because you find a lot nowadays that people are commuting out from cities to jobs in the suburbs. What is your experience with that and what recommendations do you have in terms of helping create less fractured lives for households? Does anyone want to take that one on? Yeah, uh, I, I, again, a very, a very important point because the whole uh, ecology we call sprawl could not occur without the, the massive decentralization of jobs and the leapfrog of, uh, of jobs and, house, and housing and so on. Uh, so this, is, you know, this has been one of the great motivations of, of sprawl decentralization, the lack, the lack of walkability. And I would only say in regard to that that this whole sprawl world grew up during the period of the urban crisis when the competing locations in cities were simply devalued by the sense that nothing can really work in a city that you've got to get as far to the edge as possible and that's where you're going to succeed. The fact that now we have businesses locating very specifically in the core so that they're near transit, so that their employees have, have uh, options that they that they would not have uh, if they were at the edge. In other words, our whole way of locating jobs and businesses, I think, has begun to change and is going to change even more, more radically. And the result is going to draw people back to the city. Uh, we see this already in Washington, D.C. It's going to happen already all around the country. I think it's interesting. The last few questions have really been directed at solutions. Yeah. Um, from people who seem to understand there is a problem, and we'll get back to a few other questions in a minute. Um, and we're dealing with a really tough set of forces and issues, some of them inherited from the past and embedded in all different disciplines. When the average citizen wants to know how to live a little bit greener and how to change their behavior in their own house, they know they can go buy compact fluorescents, they can buy Energy Star appliances, use less water, uh, do all of those very simple direct things and feel very good that they've actually made a change. At this scale, what can the average person do either directly or indirectly to help work towards solutions if they feel as if these are really important issues to them? Um, anyone want to start off? Yeah. No, Howie's a... nodding, so I think he's <laughs> yeah. got an idea. Well, I'm, I give advice all the time, <laughs> whether it's asked for or not. I, this is a set of choices that are on a bigger scale than buying light bulbs. You don't yes. buy a house every day. Right. Um, and so there come moments in your life when you can make decisions about whether you want to live close to where you work. Mm -hmm. um, if you're faced with a job in the suburbs and a house in the city, you might rethink that. You might change jobs or you might change houses. These are big decisions and not easy to make. What you can do on a smaller scale is use transit at a time when you might have decided to drive. You might walk a little farther. You know, a lot of us are habitual walkers, uh, sorry, habitual drivers. That's a matter of habit. Uh, and you can break that habit. So if you live a quarter mile from a, a metro stop, you can walk to the metro and take the metro. It's actually better for you. You can get your daily quotient of physical activity uh, and at the same time overcome one of the, the downsides of living in a, a more dispersed neighborhood. Uh, and on a very small scale, I mean, you have no idea how many times I go to public health or medical meetings and I look at the staircase where there's a regular staircase here and an escalator here, and all of these public health professionals take the escalator, <laughs> nobody yeah. takes the stairs. So, you know, part of what we need to do is work for better environments. People can, can participate in zoning decisions, people can push for better pedestrian infrastructure. And then part of it is the behavioral piece where we can be making decisions about how to use the environment that we live in. Uh, so that we have a smaller ecological footprint and, and live in ways that are healthier. And Robert, you had talked about leadership before. Yeah. And yeah. do you yeah. see that as part of the solution? I do. 
And I think, the, I think leadership, you know, I, I point to one area of leadership that seems theoretically remote from health issues, but I think, you know, everything we've been saying uh, points in that direction, and that's transit. And we, we know all the good reasons why transit is good, and I think we have to get the word out that transit is also a health issue. And uh, it's a really tough, living as I do in the Detroit metropolitan area, here is a, an area of five million people without any rapid transit at all. And that's a scandal in my opinion. Uh, and it's exactly the kind of thing that government, government leaders uh, have to take the initiative, of course, backed by, uh, backed by voters who just insist on it. Transit, I mean, the problem with transit is that it's, you know, it's a big, big chunk of money. You can't do, you know, as they tried in Los Angeles, you know, a couple, a few miles and so on. It's a system or nothing. But I think we've reached the point, especially if, you know, if this health aspect is emphasized, where I think people are going to, going to be willing to pay that big price for a different way of life. Well, we'll take a few more questions, and then I want to give the panelists a chance to make some concluding remarks. But I think we have some pent-up demand, and there it is <laughs> right there. Yeah. You can step yeah, up to the microphone, please. sure. Although Scott's enjoying his sprints. <laughs> Actually, it's a very nice crowd we have today, so it's nice to see everybody here. Um, my uh, experience growing up, I've grown up in the city. I'm from New York City. And I'm happy to say that my experience was living in a neighborhood that I could walk to everything. And I lament the fact that I can't do that anymore. I could walk to three supermarkets. I could walk to two banks. I could walk to one library. I could walk to one bakery. Uh, there was a number of amenities that I could walk to. And I'm happy to, you know, I'm glad that I grew up in a city and not in the burbs. Um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that the panelists had spoken about. Transit, it seems that in this country our priorities are misplaced when it comes to mass transit. It seems that in our country what we do is we subsidize the building of highways. If you recall, if we look at history like this gentleman had spoken, after World War II what happened is you had the conglomerates like General Motors, and the oil companies and the big construction companies, General Motors actually came in, they bought up the streetcars and they put them out of business so we can get the diesel buses on the roads, you know, and things like that. I really believe that the money is there, but we have to uh, change our priorities in terms of designing our neighborhoods so that they're usable by our residents. Make them, they should be higher density, they should be mixed use, we should get rid of some of these zoning requirements that let you only build one story high. Let the buildings go higher. In fact, right now we live in Colombia. My friend and I, we live in Colombia. There's a big debate going on right now about the town center to make it more walkable, more pedestrian friendly, more amenities, and make it more, more community oriented rather than the kind of driving that's required, you know, roads everywhere and people can't cross the streets, the streets are too wide and, and a whole number of things. So I just wanted to say that I think that we need to start thinking about changing our built environment because first of all I always think that we're living on what's called ancient energy, in other words oil and coal, they're depletable, they're depletable resources, we have to think about green building, we have to think about living a little bit closer to each other. Living in a higher density setting is a more efficient way of living in terms of the environment. And not only that, it gets us out and meet, you get to meet your neighbors. In the burbs, you don't get to meet your neighbors. They get in their car, they, go, they raise the garage, they go to wherever they're going, they come back, they close the doors, you don't even see your neighbors. So I just wanted to say we have to really start thinking about some changes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go uh, <laughs> get a round of applause for that. We'll go I up think here. we have one question back here. Okay, and then we'll come up here in front. Wait, you got it right? Okay. It was already asked. It was already asked. Yeah. Okay, well here and then we'll work our way around. <laughs> Thanks. I just wanted to take off on the fact that that gentleman was from New York. Can any of you comment on the New York uh, health advantage that's recently been publicized in the uh, press 
there are articles about uh, New York. It, it touches on what you've already spoken about, that people walk more. Do they move to New York because they want to walk more? Do they move to the suburbs because they're couch potatoes? But can you comment on that? Well, people, New York's sort of the ultimate in a dense city with good pedestrian infrastructure where people generally walk more and take automobiles less. That said, you know, health is a very complicated phenomenon and lots of things feed into health. So there's dietary patterns, there's social issues, there's behavioral choices like smoking and so on. Um, but I think to the extent that we can disentangle all of those influences on health, the lifestyles, the, the physical activity that's built into living in New York uh, is a contributor to health. And that piece of New York life, you know, New York's not for everybody, but that piece <laughs> of New York life is, is one of the lessons that we need to take and, and learn to apply in other communities so that that health benefit can be generalized. Some comments that New Yorkers walk faster and that they're hurrying more. <laughs> talk faster. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got quite a few um, audience questions and let's give, I think you've, you've asked a question already? No. Yeah. Okay. We'll start there, work our way through, and we can always have time for more discussion at the end of the program. But I have a question yeah. for the builder. With many of the immigrant families being comprised of multi-generational households, has their requirement of you as a builder been to build houses that are specifically designed to accommodate better a multi-generational family? Absolutely. Um, we've, <clears throat> for years, the trend was toward fewer but larger bedrooms in a house. With the immigrant families, it's completely switched around to more but smaller bedrooms, and we often see the the aging parent suite or whatever in a house. And we, if, with any one of our floor plans, it has to work harder now in terms of its functionality in the house to solve those those kinds of issues. Very definitely, we've seen we, we've seen changes to the way houses live because of the immigrant issue. Interesting. I think in the blue shirt right there. Hi. Is chronic congestion just part and parcel of the suburban lifestyle? And is there any place that is doing it better, or, or is just, just that's just part of the equation? And second thing is you could just touch on some of the health and other ramifications of long-distance commutes that we're seeing in the Washington area, in California, and Atlanta. Chronic congestion, you mean traffic, not yeah. nasal. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because we're talking about health, it could go either way. Chronic congestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'll take a crack at that because uh, driving on the road is free. Nobody's making you pay to drive on that road. I mean, you're paying in terms of your time, um, but it's a free resource, so it's going to be overused. And, um, there's, you know, a lot of potential solutions, but um, we probably need a pretty concerted effort on many fronts. Some road pricing, some transit options that are better than they are, um, and other things. Uh, whether anybody's doing a better job than anybody else? Uh, <laughs> yeah. right. Portland. Well, <laughs> yeah, I don't think anything, come, nothing specifically on roads. Yeah. yeah, I mean, LA has some stuff they have done that has had some effect, um, including the pricing and the um, light rail. But. Health consequences of long commutes. I don't think we fully understand it, but a, a, few, a few insights that we do have. Uh, more time on a road, all things being equal, raises the risk of being in a car crash. That's bad. More commuting time correlates strongly with less civic involvement in one's community. Uh, Bob Putnam in Bowling Alone calculates that every 10 additional minutes of commute time predicts 10% less social capital. There's a body of sociologic research going back 50 years showing that the long distance commuters are much less likely to participate in the PTA and similar things. Those things in turn are good for health. That social fabric is a predictor of, of lower disease rates and, and more longevity. So we can indirectly string together a couple of associations that are well understood and and hypothesize that social capital and sense of community decline with the longer commutes. And then there's some suggestion that um, uh, cardiac events are related to being in cars. 
that disproportionately heart attacks occur when people are in cars, and that we don't, that's not a solid insight yet, but it's plausible. It, it, either the, uh, the micro uh, air pollution that exists on roads can trigger cardiac events, or the stress may be a contributor, but, but we do know that there seems to be an association between uh, being in a car if you're somebody who's prone to having a heart attack and having a heart attack. So we need to learn more about that, but I think there, there's enough uh, to be concerned about that, that uh, I would personally want to think twice about taking on a 60 or a 90 minute uh, so-called super commute. We have one more question, and then I'm going to ask for concluding remarks, and then we'll take all the other questions over coffee and dessert. <laughs> um, we'll try to catch that in conversation later. Scott, just pick somebody there with your okay. magic I microphone. Uh, trying to keep on the subject of the health effects of sprawl, um, I, I really want to comment on a range of economic choices or lack of choices and, uh, and some of the areas that we've kind of glanced over because I think there's a lot to discuss about the deeper causes and looking at the effects and trying to divine behavior I think is really not a very enlightened way of discussing this. Um, the uh, uh, death by stranger is a um, phenomenon that was studied by a, um, a professor at the University of Virginia uh, who published some research on that, comparing uh, the uh, probability of death uh, in the suburbs to to the related city. And uh, if anyone here could comment on that and some of the, um, and, and on that subject. Yeah, it was Professor William Lucy who, um, who studied rates of stranger homicide in about 15 metropolitan areas and compared those to rates of motor vehicle fatalities over a 15 year period. The reason to make that comparison, it sounds like an apple and oranges comparison, but one of the drivers that get people out of cities to suburbs is they're afraid of violence in cities. There's a perception that there's a lot of menace in cities and that contributes to suburban flight. So he compared the data. Are you more likely to be killed uh, in a homicide in a city? Or once you get to the suburbs, are you more likely to be killed in a car crash? And it turned out that in every metro area he studied, the risk of dying in a car crash in the suburbs was substantially higher than the risk of stranger homicide in the city. In fact, even if you looked within the central city area, the risk of getting killed in a car crash was higher than the risk of homicide deaths. So it's, a, it's an interesting, it's one of those um, inventive insights where we compare two entirely different things and it, it may yield some insight into uh, the relative risks that, that help inform people's choices. Thank you, I'd like to give the, the panelists before we conclude just a chance to mention anything or make any concluding remarks if there's something we haven't touched on that's near and dear to your hearts that you'd like to make a point. I want to make sure we give you an opportunity because we will have time for conversation after this one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Glenn, if, is there anything left for you to <laughs> offer for us? Sure. I, when called upon, I can always comment. <laughs> um, one thing that I'm struck by by tonight's conversation is the concept of choices. Um, I fundamentally believe that most of us want to make better choices about our health, we want to make better choices about our family life, etc. But I think we're locked into a system that restricts choice as opposed to expands it. Um, affordability of choice, government regulation of choice, people in my industry choosing to not give as much choice as we should, failure for all of us to listen to what those healthy choices are. But to me, the solutions to this lie in giving people more choices, because I fundamentally believe if they have those choices, they'll make the right ones. Okay. Uh, i just like to, to raise a, a, a point that, that Harry raised uh, at the very, in, his, in his initial uh, presentation, that we didn't get to very much because I think it's maybe the most difficult one to really quantify in any way and that's the issue of mental health and just what kind of community makes us healthy uh, in this you know in an emotional way I think it's interesting that Frederick Law Olmsted the great des designer of parks and of early suburbs was intensely concerned with this issue I mean he was literally afraid scared stiff of the city 
uh, and he was looking for the kind of community that can really support uh, this kind of, of, you know, the 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 the, men, men, the mental uh, stability that we really need. And as much as I love the idea of the return to the city. I'm not sure that, that a really dense city is what we need, especially for an aging population. I think we need these intermediate places, these human scale places that are dense and walkable, but are not uh, part of a very dense, crowded uh, urban setting. I guess my uh, final parting shot would be, let's be positive. We, positivity is very important. In fact, I might retroactively nominate that we change the name of tonight's session from Can, can the Suburbs Kill You to Can Well-Designed Communities Help You Live a Happier, Healthier yeah. Life? Yeah. And I think that more and more the evidence says, yes, they can. Uh, in fact, one of the sub-themes under positive thinking is co-benefits. We don't have a medication that is good for preventing cancer, preventing heart disease, preventing arthritis, preventing depression, preventing gallbladder disease so on. But we've got a simple set of community design principles that promote physical activity and promote human interaction that demonstrably help with all of those health problems. So we're looking at some, some wonderful solutions and if we think in terms of co-benefits, take full accounting of the health outcomes of some of these design strategies, there's a really good news story to be told there. The only other point I'd make is a, a public health preparedness point. It, in recent years, the whole public health field has shifted its focus a lot to the topic of preparedness. Obviously, 9-11 moved us in that direction, and it had to. Pandemic flu calls on us to think in the future and to prepare for what may be catastrophic events. But we need to think in those terms when it comes to communities, too. We've made reference to that tonight, but this is not a static problem. It's a very dynamic problem. Our demographics are changing. Petroleum production will peak and then begin to decline. Petroleum is going to get more expensive. Climate change will put limits on the things we do. Uh, so as we think forward 20, 30, 40, 50 years to create the kind of world, not only that's good for us, but that we want to pass on to our grandchildren so that they can be as healthy as we'd like ourselves to be, we need to think in a very long-term manner. And uh, this is all about public health preparedness transgenerationally. So uh, we have good news stories for now. We have real opportunities in the choices that we're making. And uh, if we do it right, we can not only make a better world, but we can be good ancestors and pass on a better world. Margaret. Well, Howie wants to be positive, and then you have to go to the dismal science <laughs> to, to wrap things up. <laughs> um, I think a parting shot, if that's what you called yours, uh, that I would make is that I feel it's important that when we're talking about these issues and trying to identify solutions, that we very carefully define the problem that we're trying to address. And most of what we've discussed here, especially in the latter part of our discussion, has to do with health. And um, individuals, health, obesity, heart problems, that, those sorts of things. But we've also had the audience touch on issues like traffic congestion and you know what economists would call externalities, external effects from some of the actions that we take. And there are particular solutions that we look for for particular problems. And I think we need to be thoughtful and careful in identifying exactly the problem we're trying to tackle before we start developing the solutions that we're looking at. Well, we didn't come up with a yes or no answer for our title, but we actually came up with a repackaged title, which I think is great. Um, and I think the sense that our own health is entangled with the health of our communities, which is entangled with the health of our planet, demonstrates what you called the first law of ecology earlier tonight, which is everything is connected to everything else. And I think that's a nice thought to go away with, as well as the idea that we have these immense opportunities now, actually, to really think about how we want to live. So please join me in thanking our panelists. And we have plenty of time to continue this discussion over coffee and, I think, chocolate, which I understand is very healthy. <laughs> so we'll walk over there for some chocolate. Thank you.